Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion titled Quilts and Art, Engaging Activism. I'm Lauren Shelby, the Education and PR Manager for the Margaret Walker Center. The Margaret Walker Center is an archive and museum dedicated to the preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of African-American history and culture. The Stitch Their Names Project is one that consists of a group of cross stitchers and quilters across the country and beyond. The goal of this project is to honor the legacy of black individuals of whom have died due to racial violence. Many hearts and hands have worked on these quilts, over a hundred people. Today, the Margaret Walker Center begins our second program in honor of the Stitch Their Names Memorial Project. In this program, we have three amazing panelists who will, will discuss how their art engages activism. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our moderator, the Dr. lovely Dr. Shauna Smith. Dr. Shauna Smith is assistant professor of the English department, the English Modern Languages, Modern Foreign Languages and Speech Communication at Jackson State University. She is also education coordinator for her department, supervising English education majors. Dr. Smith specializes in African-American literature and culture and oral history. Her current research interests focus on how orality and social justice functions in young adult fiction and contemporary activism, how it intersects with African-American women's literature in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries and utilizing oral history to preserve cultural memory. She's most recently published in Black Bone, 25 years of the Appalachian poets and Black Lives Still Matter. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I just have to say, I really appreciate every opportunity that I have to work with the Walker Center. Um, I love the work that you do and I really appreciate your invitation with to working um, with you all tonight as moderator. So one thing that I wanna say that I, I am so proud of uh, Jackson State University's consistency in discussing and presenting panels on art and activism. Art is active in preserving uh, representations of history, informing and inspiring viewers, and engaging in conversation like what we're going to do tonight. It is intertextual, which means that the conversation cuts across the genre of art, across the point of view of the authors and audiences, and across time. In light of this, we do have an incredible panel tonight uh, to continue a rigorous conversation on Stitch Their Names, Quilts and Art, Engaging Activism. So first I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Cassie Turnipseed. So Dr. Turnipseed is an assistant professor in the history and philosophy department at JSU. Uh, she is a skilled public historian, currently engaged in research on the Gullah Geechee culture. Um, at Mississippi Valley State University, she initiated and developed plans for the Cotton Pickers of America Monument, Sharecroffers and Interpretive Center, and the Cotton Kingdom Historical Trail. She received her doctorate in public history from Middle Tennessee uh, State University. And I also enjoy working with her on other uh, groups on campus. Now, I would also like to introduce now uh, Ms. Sabrina Howard. Ms. Howard is a Jackson, Mississippi native who earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, in Communication Design and Illustration from Atlanta College of Art. As a graphic art artist and painter, she is impulsive. At least that is one way she describes her vibrant and expressionistic portraits that give subtle nods to social challenges and themes. With her preferred medium, acrylic, Howard handles a brush the way a seasoned writer uses a pen. And I love that metaphor. So taking repurposed canvases and readily recyclable wood, she assembles the materials into abstract platforms, mm -hmm. the result of her passionate broad, broad strokes and bold strokes are emotion laced, multidimensional, and uh, pay tribute to Cuba's style with a gritty urban twist. And so finally, we have uh, Dr. Ebony Lumumba, who is my boss. 
And uh, Dr. Lumumba is Associate Professor of English at Jackson State University, where she chairs the Department of English, Foreign Languages, and Speech Communication. She also teaches courses in global and American literatures. Uh, she received her PhD in English literature from the University of Mississippi and specializes in post-colonial literatures across the global South and black mothering as resistance in her research, academic publications and instruction. So Dr. Lumumba is also an avid supporter of education and the arts. Uh, her zeal for both are, uh, are shown in her, her participation in community projects. And she currently serves as board member for a number of organizations, uh, including, but not limited to, the Foundation for Mississippi History, uh, the Mississippi Humanities Council, and the Mississippi Book Festival. So I'm so excited to have this conversation with these ladies. And so what we're gonna do is um, just have a conversation. I've got some questions that I wanna ask each one of you and I wanna start with this one. And I'll just say that um, any one of you can um, respond first. There's no particular order to this, uh, but I want you to first tell us how you um, entered your particular medium of art. So how did you get into your art or your quilting? I, I'll jump in because <laughs> I like to say that I'm an historian pretending to be an artist. But until I got the PhD, I was an artist pretending to be a historian. So just now that I have it in, in the proper perspective, the public historian is an artist. And she brings creativity to the whole field of history because it's applied history. It's, it's about doing something with the information. And so as an artist, that means it translates into some sort of creative um, uh, event or project or uh, any kind of activity where you're actually applying history in a very creative way. So I think I'll just kind of land it there, but that's really uh, how I see myself now as an artist who have become and acquired a PhD in history, so. Thank you, I like that. Would someone else like to share how they entered their particular medium? Yeah, I can jump in. So I am uh, by trade, a critical writer, but I also write creatively and I'm a visual artist. All of those mediums though have in common that I elevate the platform and the identities of black women in various realms. And I, I have to say, I came to that uh, by being inspired by the women, the black women in my life. So my grandmother, my mother, my sister, I watched them over the course of my life be creative in really unconventional ways. So in their gardening, in their cooking, in the way that they were able to establish some sort of economic stability for themselves and our family and their families, uh, in the way that they navigated professional spaces that black women were not uh, allowed in necessarily or welcomed in. So I watched my grandmother, my mother, my sister be creative their entire lives in really unconventional ways. And that has led me to uh, using my creativity to sing this story about uh, the Black women that I know and the Black women that I don't know and the Black women that I cannot know, right? Ancestors and and the like. And so I think I came to my art uh, from this deep inspiration and uh, gratitude to Black female identity, specifically those who are, are in my family. Okay. I can definitely relate to that. Definitely. Okay, Ms. Howard, would you like to share? Yes. Well, I uh, I wouldn't use the term enter into my art actually because that's all that I remember. As far as I can, um, if, as I've been told by my parents, I've always been a creative. So what has happened over time is I've evolved with what's happening around me. And it's also reflected currently in most of the art that I create now. Uh, art is 
is part of me. It's, it's who I am. And as Nina Simone once quoted was, how can you be an artist and not reflect the time? If you can believe it or not, there was a time where I didn't realize that I was actually reflecting the time. You know, and I started getting questions about uh, the things that I was creating. I, I wasn't certain of, I was like, wow, yes, that's, I'm, I'm doing that because that's all that I can remember needing to do. I also, I, I grew up with a grandmother who quilted often and I would watch her every day, every night. That was, it was like her job. She went over and she cut patches and, and that's, that's what I grew up seeing. And that was nurtured in me as far as creating with different mediums, as well as, you know, what I did to create um, the, the pieces that I have now. So um, I've, I've always created uh, as a child and now as a, a mother and professional is very much a part of me. And I'm excited to be able to contribute the things that I see or feel through the art that I create. Mm -hmm. You know, just already I'm hearing two things, you know, that are threads. And one of them is that art is who we are. It's part of our identities, right? And then um, also I'm hearing almost a, a little nod to Alice Walker's In Search of Our, our Mother's Gardens. Uh, mm -hmm. So art is the way that all of us are experiencing it um, is something that's passed to us, something that we've seen, right, and grown up with. So, you know, actually the second question kind of follows the first. Some of you all might have answered this already, and that is what type of artist are you? So, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Turnipseed, you were talking about how you are uh, a public historian, right? A public intellectual. So um, is that the type of artist that you are or is there more, more to that? It's so much more to that <laughs> um, because I also collect art and I'm inspired by um, African art probably more specifically than any other kind of art. And if you could see the room that I'm in, it's actually a museum and it's collections of, of pieces from all over the continent. But, you know, in addition to collecting others pieces of art, I have a shrine to my niece, for example, um, that I created as a memorial to her. Um, because unfortunately she had an asthma attack at the age of 19. And um, so anyway, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, creating something that's a monument, something that's in dedication, something that, um, re that truly reflects meaning and sentiment and are, 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 are things that I think that I'm attracted to. And I think that's true with uh, the collections because with even with African masks, for example, they're monuments to ancestors, right? And the piece that's on the wall behind me is a king's quilt is what it's called from Nigeria. And so they have meaning, they have significance. And so my art, the things I collect, as well as the things that I construct, um, I do jewelry as well, but it, and then I also create elephants from broken jewelry. So I create these wonderful, in fact, I have a series called uh, the COVID-19 uh, elephant series because I wanted to do 19 different elephants of all the broken jewelry and, and bits and pieces of artifacts that actually are quite nice, actually. I think I'll do an exhibit. So yeah, that's the kind of art that I do. <laughs> I like hearing that. I like hearing that. What about the rest of you? What type of artist are you? I think it, that's not a question that I can remember ever being asked. And as I'm looking at the panel, I just want to acknowledge that each of the women on this panel, moderator included, are walking artists, you know, just in the way that we have uh, curated our own attire and the way that you all are speaking right now through your accessories, your walking art. Um, but if I have to answer a question about what type of artist I am, I'm an artist, I think, uh, that uh, responds and 
fills gaps that I see, the spaces and gaps that exist for uh, our cultural history as Black people, specifically Black women, uh, all of the erasures that have happened across generations, all of the uh, omissions that have been forced upon us uh, that regard our truth, uh, that deny us equity, that is the type of art that I find myself drawn to producing, whether it is in the written form or whether it's through uh, my art is typically watercolors. And so, and there, there, that is significant as well because uh, I tie Black women's fluidity and necessity for life to water. Uh, and that is steeped in um, deeply in our African ancestral history. And so I, if I have to just answer that question simply, I'm an artist that responds to uh, the spaces and the gaps and the inequities that I feel very deeply, not only that I see and witness, but that I feel. So any, any instance that uh, seems in, unjust or inequitable, then my art responds to that, my writing responds to that, my critical work responds to that, uh, my visual art responds to that. Okay, I like that. Okay, Ms. Howard. Well, I am a, I would consider a multimedia artist. Uh, the bulk of my work, uh, I use repurposed items, meaning found items, and create these multidimensional pieces. My actual um, way of creating what seemed now as a style what actually was actually born from a need to create larger and not have readable materials to create so i started assembling things because i wanted to work bigger bigger but my my pocket was saying no you can afford this little canvas right here it's like well no i gotta do this project so i started assembling things and then everything grew from there and and with that um like I said, I'm a multimedia, multi-purpose type artist. My main uh, medium now is acrylic, and I love it. As a, as a busy mom, it's, uh, acrylic is very forgiving, and I love it. But as far as my, the style of work that I do now being born from a need, uh, with that, I would say that we're all creatives. And I love sitting and having conversations to help people who don't realize that they're actually artists, they're actually creatives, like sitting down and, and giving them examples and have, have, helping them figure out what it is that they bring and what they offer. I mean, we have to create on a daily as, as moms and professionals. We have to, you know, resolve issues in our classrooms, out you know, in, in other situations outside. So it's like, um, we're all artists, we're all creatives. We, we just need to tap into it. So uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I like, I've been taking notes uh, on all of you all. And actually, I just have to say, um, first, I know I keep going in the in this order. But uh, Dr. Turnipseed, when you were talking about, you know, just especially the jewelry, because I'm really interested in jewelry. I want to purchase your jewelry, so you might have a showing on campus. <laughs> but I saw how excited uh, that um, Dr. Lumumba was when you were talking <laughs> about the elephants. And I know that there's a, there's a reason for that. So I believe you have an audience uh, for your work. So I wanted to say, <laughs> I wanted to say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Lumumba, I really appreciate that you were descriptive in how you saw yourself as an artist. So um, you knew that you wore many different hats and it's like, it didn't sound like you wanted to pri privilege one in particular because mm -hmm. they are fluid. So mm -hmm. I liked how you were being more descriptive when I was saying, what type of artist are you? And that you were really using adjectives, which is such an English uh, <laughs> professor thing to do. And finally, I just have to, to, to tell you, uh, Ms. Howard, that um, I knew I had recognized your name. So I looked you up and I know that you're responsible for that wonderful mural that's on campus that's representative of really powerful Black women and Black women who are artists and activists. So I, I just really appreciate all of this. So I have to say this because um, I know I've got a bunch of questions that I want to ask. But um, for our audience, you are welcome to uh, place questions in chat. And we would love to address your questions um, later on as we go. So please feel free to um, type out any questions in our chat and we'll make sure that we get to as many as possible, okay? 
So the next question is um, what stories are you telling through your artistry? Mm. What stories are you are you telling? Mm. And that's open. Well, since we have an order established. <laughs> Oh, the stories I'm telling are the stories of Grandmama Nim. And I love saying that word, Grandmama Nim, because it's like these were the cotton pickers. These were the people who worked from kin to kink and were never thanked. And these are the people who had given so much to this country, to this world, to this culture, to everything. They gave their lives working from Ken to Kent. And if y'all don't know what Ken to Kent is, it's from Kentsy in the morning to Kentsy at night. And rarely were they paid or they went from a system of no pay to a system of very low pay as sharecroppers. And I, and I think that I know that we are indebted to them. We need to say thank you. We need to understand that they did it for us. They had a vision and for us to just get in tune with that and understand the dignity of that and the purpose of that and how humane that was, then therefore it gets interpreted in, in ways like building a monument and tribute to Grandmama Nim for picking all that dog on cotton and never ever be ashamed of that. And that's the problem that I think we're having with people who have only gotten the um, the shameful, but I don't know why and how it can be considered that, but the, the shameful interpretation of picking cotton. And because the narrative has been told in such a way, it, it makes us ashamed that all that needs to be corrected. So. My art is about telling the story, the truth, and in order for people to to uh, love on them, on their spirit. So it articulates itself in so many ways. I do the Sweat Equity Investment in the Cotton Kingdom Symposium, for example, where we just bring the narratives on how to create um, uh, everything from reparations and <laughs> retribution to return on investment, to understand what that history was and to respect them and to, um, and then therefore do things that are more in that line as opposed to being ashamed and don't want to talk about cotton. So, mm. yeah. I love that, Doc. I think you can encompass everything that we're going to say. It's hard to add to that, but you know, the question of the story that I endeavor to tell in whatever I produce, and that goes beyond the intended art that is in uh, how I carry myself, the conversations that I have, the connections uh, that I make intentionally. I'm telling our mamas mm -hmm. stories as well. So Grandmama Nim, that's right up my my alley. What I, what I realize is that history ignores Black women. And the Black women that do get placed in history, it's selective. Right. We can probably count on our hands how many black women are deemed as notable from 1850 until 1950. From 1950 to 2021, we get a select group of these black women that are deemed as notable. And I just think about the uh, the 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 droves and droves of black women who are working, who are creating who are impacting our lives and making them better and creating life and protecting that life. All of these women that we never will hear about. That's what my art is about. I think about my grandmother, Ornell Jones, to speak her name because naming is important. And that's one of the ways that people continue to live and become immortal is speaking their name. But my grandmother, uh, she had an eighth grade education. She uh, worked her entire life, was the mother of six children and the, you know, the play mama of countless children in the neighborhood. And what I realized is she's one of the most brilliant souls I've ever encountered in my life. Mm -hmm. And so the, the time that I spent with her, the wisdom that she held in her little five foot uh, nothing body was so astounding to me because I saw also the white family she worked for see her only as a domestic 
uh, servant. I saw people in town see her only as a little black woman or a, a, a little bus driver or a little nurse or that little black woman that makes those cakes. And for us, she was our world. She was uh, the center of our family. She was the, the epicenter of uh, you know, the way that we lived and we saw the world. And so I thought that everybody probably has these black women in their lives and where are their stories? They're not gonna be the center of a commercial during Black History Month. They're not gonna be the center of an essay. There are no novels about them, but their lives are so impactful and they are, their contributions are so rich. And so the art that I create, my writing, my visual art is about these women these women, and when I talk about our mamas, I'm not only talking about our biological mothers, they are absolutely quintessentially important. I'm also talking about, like I said, the play mamas, the neighborhood mamas, the god mamas, the aunties mm -hmm. that bought us what our mamas wouldn't buy us because they didn't okay. think we needed it, right? Uh, these women are the, the, you know, we're here to talk about quilting, but they are the, the piecework in the quilt of certainly of who I am, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but also who so many of us are. And it, it um, I, get, I have a visceral reaction when black women are disregarded in any realm. And we, aren't, we, we don't only see that from the dominant community, we see it within our cultural movements as well. So we talk about civil rights, we talk about black arts, all of these movements, even Black Lives Matter, where black women are still kind of ushered to the margins, are still told to play this role, still have their identities questioned. We still wonder if they can be victims if they wore this on their Instagram or on Facebook the week before they died. And so the art that I produce is to really draw into the humanity of Black women. And, you know, we're no better than anyone else, but we're certainly no worse. And we deserve, we deserve equal footing in the story of mankind. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Miss Howard. You're welcome to jump in. <laughs> well, um, currently the the stories or what's what's happening with the pieces that I'm creating is I uh they focus on resolution as uh rather than just giving a photo of someone who has experienced a particular injustice. Um, for example, I have a, a piece behind me now, and we see a fist and some peace lilies. This piece is actually titled Power and Peace. And this is one of my resolution pieces. I started to, to think like with everything that's going on around us now, what is it that we need? What will resolve these issues surrounding racial and social injustices that's going on currently? And this was one of my resolution pieces uh, with uh, peace lilies is the easiest plant to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> it, needs, it needs very little water. It needs very little light. Yes, it's so beautiful, right? So I figured, well, if it's that easy to take care of a peace lily, shouldn't it be just as easy to create peace during a movement of so much racial and social injustice? So my pieces are that I'm creating now the the stories I hope will evoke conversations surrounding the resolutions so that you know these pieces and other things that we create and write will help resolve and resolve these issues and make uh, this world a better place to live in. So mm -hmm. that's what my pieces the, the stories I'm telling currently. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. This really is turning into, uh, you know, the subtext of in search of our mother's gardens or in search of our grandmother's gardens in so yeah. many ways, yeah. because you all are telling an origin story of how you got into art from grandmothers. And I love that you also included uh, what I call other mothers. And this is a, a, a plug. You can call it shameless if you want to, but every Friday before Mother's Day, I proclaim other Mother's Day because I might not have given birth, but I am mothering a whole bunch of children mm -hmm. and cash shopping a whole bunch of children, <laughs> especially college students. So um, I appreciate that. But also I appreciate just, I heard. You, I'm sorry, but I appreciate what you just said because I too uh, have chosen not to have, but I have children. But 
all of my students is so funny. They call me auntie. They call me Dr. Auntie, you know, because it's, and I love it. I embrace that, that, that sentiment. I think that is so special to me as a professor. You know, I, I just recognize my role. Yeah. I'm not your mama. I'm your auntie. And so don't bring no excuses to me. You know, we ain't going to play like that. And that along with, um, you know, being a godmother and an auntie is a particular role that's very special. You know, as uh, I think as a creative black woman, we have fun. Then I take them back home to their mama. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I do want to say, I think because we're having a conversation, I know that, you know, we've had an order. But if anybody wants to jump in and piggyback off of anybody else's comments, I would say that the floor is a welcoming space for that. Mm -hmm. OK, definitely. Um, but I always hear things in the middle of conversation. I was hearing everything from Pearl Clegg's. Uh, we speak we speak their names. Isn't that what it is? Or we speak our names. Mm -hmm. um, this honoring that she had years ago when when Oprah Winfrey honored, you know, um, mm -hmm. at the Legends Ball. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I was hearing. Um, just so many things, so many things. But I do want to say that uh, there really is an active uh, uh, response that's going on um, on Facebook. So it's not in our chat, but it's in the Facebook comments. So again, you're welcome to post your questions there. There's one that I want to bring up right now that uh, Marshall McDowell was asking, and that is, what are the circles of supporters you rely on for your quilt expressive life? Hmm. Well, it's two parts. So I'll ask that one first. What are the circles of supporters you rely on for your for your quilt expressive life or your art? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much for posting that. So I'll, I'll jump in because I love the terminology quilt expressive life. Um, when we talk about quilting and activism, um, quilting specifically and womanism, uh, we're talking about piecing together what you have, especially when quilting and activism are merged, we're talking about patchwork quilting, uh, which is a distinctive, uh, a distinctive mode of producing quilts. And so when I think about it, it is a lovely metaphor for what we produce, the women in this group and so many women uh, that surround our lives, what we produce are pieces of what we have to work with and to make something beautiful and creative and useful and practical and functional out of it is um, absolute brilliance. And when we think about it in relation to womanism, this distinctive um, uh, faction of, or this distinctive mode of feminism that is correlated specifically to women of color and black women specifically, then we're talking about not being given much not having access to equitable resources, but still producing so much life, still producing so much beauty. And so uh, I wanted to contextualize it that way and then answer the circle of supporters that I rely on are uh, in my community, right? So they are my family, my mother, um, the, they're my, the men in my life, my father, my brother, my husband, my children are uh, contribute a great deal to this sort of expressive life quilt that I am crafting as a black woman that is very much patchwork, that is very much a, a bunch of rags stitched together um, and putting on a facade of being all put together and um, balancing. And I think it balances, it speaks to this balancing your creative work with your life. Um, I fundamentally believe that, that none of this work is separate. So we tend to be told that mothering is over here and then your professional life is over here and your creative life is over here. But I, I think my sister artists would agree with me by saying these are all intertwined. They are quilted together. They are patches on the same, uh, on the exact same uh, garment or, or, or quilt of who we are and who we are becoming. And so to balance that, you've got to give it all space to breathe, to exist, and you've got to make sure that it's stitched together because the moment that you separate it, the moment that it becomes separate from the other thing that matters, from the other thing that is fundamental to your identity, then it's no longer truthful. It's no longer genuine or useful. Or authentic. Or authentic. You know, quilting, the scraps aren't useful unless they're put together, mm -hmm. unless they're stitched together. 
Right. And so all of these moments that we have and these identities that we carry, they have to be intertwined in order to be useful, to be the full, the full quilt. Let me just piggyback off of sister, because I am a very, very single woman. I have my oldest daughter who is Lulu. Lulu, where you at? And uh, <laughs> she's my dog, my puppy dog, my fur baby. Let me just say my fur baby. And um, I am a divorcee, I guess that's the word. And so I just live a very singular life that I just enjoy to the utmost. But I did want to say <laughs> that she said, you, Ebony, you said that uh, this facade of pulling it together, girl, you got it together. And I love I'll take it. your life. You know, the whole way in which you are that mother, you are the chair of a department, you are this professor, you are the first lady of Jackson, you are so many things that I just like, woo, I'm so proud of you. I just wanted to say that because, honey, you got that. Thank you. From, from the blessings of our grandmama names and, and it is incorporated in your spirit and your life. And I and I I give you all that praise because I, I have deep respect for um the work that you're doing and, and, and the life that you represent. But I also wanted to also say our people, our mothers, our fathers even, but particularly the women, made a way out of no way. And they were so very special in doing that, piecing together quilts, you know, piecing together rags from everything yes. imaginable and then creating something that was just magnificent, that are again, collector's items that are, that are artifacts that must be protected and preserved and interpreted in a respectful way. It, they're just purely works of art. And so again, it takes us to interpret those narratives and to to feed respect and and love and and understanding, you know, into that world that they created out of nothing. And they have done so much, you know, that again, how dare any of us be ashamed or or just don't praise them and don't elevate them and don't create monuments, memorial sites and historic sites, you know, that that honors them and tells their story. So I think the circle of support that I have really is the spirit of mm -hmm. all of that, is the spirit of the ancestors that I surround myself in and I can't move without it, you know, and it is it is a God force in my world that I truly embrace. And I guess I'm at that age where I just, that's what I want, that's what I need, you know, to just kind of take all of my work um, to, the, to, the, to the next level. I just need that ancestral spirit. So that circle is hard to explain, but it is what it is. And I recognize it and I embrace it in my life. Hey, the, the quilt expresses life. I I love that metaphor there yeah. because uh, when after reading that question, I thought like, I said, okay, uh, quilt expresses life. Uh, my, my brush is, is my needle. My paint is my thread. Uh, my canvas is my quilt frame. And the stories that I paint are the very patchwork of everyone and everything that surrounds me and like uh dr lamoma mentioned if we were to to minus out uh what we have to balance with our life regarding our kids our work our involvement in the community and all the other things that we busy ourselves with every day if we removed all of that stuff and we were just left with creating then we would have no substance what right. would we create it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same luster it wouldn't have the same feel so as far as having those those uh circle of supporters it's um everything that's happening with us is the support because it would be strikingly different if things were any different than what it is now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well speaking of of circles of support uh again uh the Facebook comments are on fire. And I noticed one name in particular that is commenting in support quite a bit. 
and that is, uh, let me make sure I got her name. I know that it's Lucille. I believe it's Lucille Green. Uh, and she's especially made some strong comments or response to you, Dr. Turnipseed. But one question that I actually had that I noticed that, um, that someone actually wrote in, I'll write it the way that, she, I'll read it the way that she said it. And that's Lisa Wolfwork. She said, what is it about quilting that makes it suitable, uh, makes it a suitable medium to engage in activism? What mm -hmm. is it about quilting that makes it suitable for activism? I think Ebony described it so well. Um, maybe you could say it again, Ebony, just the sure. way in which, you know, the, the patchwork of it all. But I'll, I'll, you know, let's go with that. Yeah, so quilting is an ideal medium for activism because it comes out of disenfranchised communities. And it is a way to speak uh, that is coded. You can only interpret the true meaning of the quilt and the true value of the quilt if you are in tune, if you have ears to hear, as the Bible says. And so um, that's that is uh, critical in activism because rhetoric in activism has to be coded and it has to be deliberate and it has to have meanings that can be explicit or hidden. And quilting does that. Um, when we think about taking tattered pieces and making it into something that is not only uh, beautiful and intricate, but also practical, that's what activism has to be, right? So there is an aspect of activism that has to be aesthetic, that has to have optics that people need to see, that is the demonstration part of it. Quilting hat or quilts have that. And then there has to also be a very practical part. There has to be a plan. It is intricate. You cannot deviate from it if you're going to complete this project. And that's what quilting is. Uh, also, it is because it is an art form that's not only from disenfranchised communities, but specifically Black female communities when we think about uh, the Western world. And so textile art uh, in African culture before the tr slave trade was distinctly male. Men dealt in textiles more than women, but then the slave trade comes and we have this art form transition into something that enslaved women had uh, charge of. And so enslaved women were oftentimes able to uh, escape uh, the more harsh uh, elements of servitude if they could sew, if they could piece together things that the household needed or that the property needed, then they were valued in a way in that realm. And so this was a way of negotiating a way to live. Uh, and then moving forward, I saw someone in the comments, I think it was uh, Lucille Green talk about a quilting bee. When we look at the history of quilting bees, these were not only opportunities for these women to come together to produce a blanket, but can you imagine the conversations that were happening, and the, happening across those pieces? Can you imagine what was brought as pieces? These are archives. Quilting, mm -hmm. Quilts are archival. Mm -hmm. They are these humble uh, manifestations of deep history that again is coded for only those who have eyes to see or you know ears to hear and so that's what activism is activism is covert at times it is expressive all the time it is deliberate it is measured and it um is practical and that's what quotes are and i think the whole activism part of it shows our cleverness you know the fact that you know when you when you deal with the history of quilts and you understand too, it has a very, very strong, solid foundation in um, sending coded messages, right? And uh, I know there was a lot of debate about under, whether or not it was used in the Underground Railroad, which I choose to believe it did. And it had maps within them that were structured within the, the context of the quilt itself. And you had to understand the code. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the code language was embedded into it, along with so many other messages of um, survival. I know, like just braiding seeds into the hair kind of thing. But even yeah. that was in, embedded in the quilt, you know, as it was practical, as it was comfort, as it kept you warm. But it also gave you an instruction. It gave you direction. It gave you again, just thinking about how people navigated through slavery into freedom and, yeah. and, and just knowing that that served a purpose too. Quilts 
serve, serve the purpose to give real direction to people who were in search of freedom. Can I just say to that comment, Dr. Turner, see the, mm -hmm. the dispute that historians have about whether or not quilts mm -hmm. had these maps for the Underground Railroad or whether they were uh, you know, thrown over lines to signal safe houses. I think it, you know, there's some irony there because when we think about anybody that likes spy movies, okay, the, the coded message or the illegal piece, it has to self-destruct. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the, that. thank you. The dispute <laughs> is there are no more of these quilts left. We cannot prove that they had these codes that were sewn into these pieces. Well, that would be idiotic to leave the evidence behind. So I really want you to believe that this is a blanket. The only way to do that is yeah. for me to use it. And if you use a fabric time and time again, then it's going to self-destruct. But that's brilliant. That's what 007 uh, did, you know, <laughs> James Bond. Once I get the message, I can't leave this thing around for them to prove that I am breaking a law that is punishable by death. Exactly. So exactly. it makes perfect sense that there Please are no- say that. Please well, say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's the genius of it all again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's true. They didn't want you to figure out the code. Right. So let's, we're going to use this thing on the bed too, <laughs> as well as, <laughs> as a map. And it's not going to exist because we don't want you to be able to prove this thing. If, <laughs> Why would we have that evidence now? Okay. They were the know? original spies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And we should make a movie on that. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's write the script. <laughs> tell that let's story ourselves. That goes back into, again, interpreting your own history and telling your own story. And we know these things instinctually. Yeah. It's just a spiritual connection. And we understand it, whether anybody else do or not. So that's why it's important for us to just write it down. You yes. know, and, and interpret it in a way that um, gets translated into film, gets translated into all other children's books, especially. Yeah. yeah. You know, which we need to do more of. So. Sure. And and then the illustrations behind. I see us doing that. Come on, y'all. Let's do this children's book. Sabrina, you got some ideas? Yes. Sabrina is the visual <laughs> Always, artist. always. I'm running <laughs> over with ideas. I'm <laughs> talking about um, quilts regarding activism with coding. I, if I can just directly relate like something more common to people so that they understand what was actually happening with the coding of the quilt. Okay, even now, as a, speaking as a graphic artist, you can create this super beautiful uh, design and then you have to have it go through some some processes where it's approved by people and proofread. But wow. if, you're, if your mind isn't in the right state to find these certain intricacies, uh, inconsistencies that will alert the wrong people, right? You can mm. create a beautiful graphic and have a million typos, but because it's so beautiful and it's being, you know, wow, look at those colors. Look, look how that's sitting yeah. there. Look at that photo. That photo is great. You will miss. Mm. those key things that you should see. So imagine these beautiful, intricate pieces and they have all these signals and flags and maps. If your mind isn't in the right mindset to see it, you won't. So they were perfect. Wow. And wow. You know, we have a, we, <laughs> it's the same thing happens now. If you can't see it, like what you said, you know, those who have ears to hear and yeah. those who have eyes to see. But if you're not there, you won't see it. And it's perfect for the messages that were needing to be gotten out at that time. Oh my God. So using it as a, a, a active a activist type metaphor is perfect. I'm ready. And, and there's this moment too. We got, we got that book coming. <laughs> I'm ready for it. I'm ready. You know, there's also this necessity in activism to not only deconstruct, but to create. And so, you know, some of the times when we see these, you know, movements become lopsided is that so much focus is on ripping to shreds what we don't want to exist in. And we haven't made a plan for what we want to replace it with. And quilting is this lovely metaphor of ripping to shreds what's not working and then using some of the, the pieces that could withstand that mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. something new, functional, beautiful, that tells the story that you want to tell. And so- yeah. Yeah, that, that it's like that, an anchor piece. It's like an anchor piece or something. Yeah. It's, you know, the strongest uh, fabric or message or code, mm -hmm. and then things are built around that. I should. I, oh, I'm start. Oh Lord, let me start sounds writing. like a movie too. <laughs> no, all of it. 
I'm going to say this. When you all were talking about this movie, I know that you're serious about all of this that you're saying, because I already wrote down everybody's role. So we've, got, we've got a script writer. We've got a set designer. We also have a costumer. It's all right here so we can make it happen. Um, I don't know if anybody knew that my spiritual gift is instigation. So I love making a thing happen. Set it off. Set it off. Girl, we're doing this. We're doing this. It's already done. It's a gift. Well, and I, I enjoy that just having a free flowing conversation anticipated a lot of the questions that that I would have had. And one thing that that definitely caught my ear, um, someone mentioned um, this idea of the metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. So I did have a question about that. Um, so what I said was that I see quilts as a metaphor. They are used for comfort, you know, and protection, but in activism, they are used to provide direction, okay? And I know we already mentioned the historic piece as part of it and to protect from the discovery of all of these, these things, these escape routes and all of that. Mm -hmm. So actually my question was, can you talk more about quilts as a metaphor, a symbol or a sign? And I know that we already started engaging in that, but I didn't know if anyone had any more to add as far as, as quilts being metaphor, symbol or sign. You know, definitely. I started out this conversation talking about the spaces and gaps that exist uh, for Black cultures, right? Our histories that have been erased, not having the privilege of being documented uh, is, I mean, we could use that language to talk about current immigration issues, right? That there is a privilege in being documented that should not be denied human beings. And so when we talk about Black cultures and all of these generations where the history is lost, the history has been co-opted and thrown away. The history has been snatched and pulled from the, what didn't even exist in the books, right? When we talk about, when we think about quilting as a metaphor to salvage those scraps and to create this historical uh, archive, this sort of fabric griot that tells history in a way that it has been denied uh, for so many generations to our people. That is what quilting specifically has done for my family. And so there are, you know, uniform pieces and wedding dresses and baby clothes and t-shirts from movement activities, all of that salvaged in this one piece to one, save a piece of that to document ourselves as Tony K. Bambara would say, salvation is the issue. That's what we're struggling against, against being documented and saved in history, but also to demonstrate the connect, the cohesion between all of these moments and the cohesion between uh, among our history. And so you know, I think about quilting as a metaphor for the struggle that we have as a people mm -hmm. to exist uh, as not only something uh, aesthetically uh, beneficial, but also useful, that we are useful not only in our practicality, but useful in the, in the way that we're, we constellate or, or pull together so many moments of, of who we are. And so, that, you know, that's what quilting has meant to me and my family. I have a cousin, uh, Linda Pate, who has taken on quilting as our uh, in our family. She still does the quilts. And I find now that we get them for moments of celebration. So when you have a baby or a wedding or you graduate, I have a quilt for all of those moments uh, in my life from my cousin, uh, Linda. And for me, what it does is deny, it resists all of these times where we weren't documented, where there aren't records of my grandparents' birth, where there aren't deeds to the land that was stolen from people, where there aren't uh, degrees or diplomas because folks were denied education. We have this document that we were here mm -hmm. and this is who we are and that we are useful and that we are valuable. And we've got this long history, whether it's in these tangible hegemonic archives and records or not, we were here. Yeah. You know, just building on that, um, I think the metaphor is now, as, as it relates to quilts, has to be intentional, on purpose. We, we just gonna um, build on it, you know, build on what has already been established with, with I think what uh, they used to call a tick, a cotton tick or something. Mm -hmm. Do y'all know about that? It's like 
It's like yeah. just making the bedding. I, this is new stuff I learned because you know I'm from San Francisco. I don't know much about <laughs> stuff, but I'm learning this stuff. And it's like okay, the cotton tick, and then how they build on that, and you know, with the different patches and that whole thing, and 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 what I'm discovering because I'm collecting quilts, y'all. You know, I have about 15 quilts back there that are old, and and I've had people donate them to me from my godmothers, my mother, my aunties. I did this wonderful conference that's called, in fact, I have it, the poster here. I don't know if you could see it, but it was called Cotton Quilts and the Freedom Narratives. And um, it was an amazing display mm -hmm. of, of these quilts telling these stories and it was just the narrative that just got built upon, you know what I'm saying? So it was like intentional telling the story of freedom, you know, and how these quilts created that narrative. And people from all over were just sending in quilts that that spoke to that concept, to that thing. You know, so I say being intentional means like, you know, just creating um an idea, a concept, a, a, a focus, and then letting the quilts tell that story are in fact creating quilts that tell that story mm -hmm. you know, in ways that, that may have been lost or may have been destroyed somehow. But recreating those narratives on purpose, I think is, is the next. Yeah. Yeah, of where we gotta go. Mm -hmm. Dr. Turner, see, I would like to uh, piggyback on your uh, or saying that we need to be intentional and um, per be make it our purpose to use quilts as a metaphor. And by that, I mean as as creatives, um, as I paint, I I pray that my paintings and creations will continue to peel back the covers of social and racial injustices and any other despair disparities plaguing our community, like like our grandmothers and great grandmothers did with making these quilts. And uh, Dr. Lumumba, as far as, um, you know, recording those important things in life, you know, mm -hmm. looking back, I wish I still had those uh, quilts that my great grandmother and grandmother made. Um, I'm going to try to find them. There's somebody house. But anyway, <laughs> looking back on them, you know, there was there was a real time capsule there with the yeah. fabrics and the materials and the threading and the memories and sitting around the family and saying, oh, I remember that dress. I remember I hated yes. that. You know, I love I love those jeans and that lace on, that, mm -hmm. on those socks, you know, but, you know, it's, it's important that, yes, that we be intentional and more pur purposeful with um, how we relate our, our quilt metaphor. Mm -hmm. Right on. Now, I have to say this. I, I'm noticing the time, and I know that we need to wrap it up soon. I know we've got a little bit of grace, but I also want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we want to tie all of this together because we know that there is a, a theme to all of this. And the title for this is Stitch Their Names, Quilts and Art, Engaging Activism. So my last question that I really want to ask is how, um, how is quilting and art currently being used to depict racial violence? Or why is it so significant now to stitch their names? You know, I've been thinking about that and one, I don't think that the quilts that have been created specifically around um, the, vis the victims of this tragic racial violence is anything new in terms of what we have used quilts for in our community. We've been documenting ourselves in various ways. The beautiful aspect of it, however, is that uh, patchwork quilting is redemptive. And so you are redeeming this tattered garment. And in terms of our victims, uh, the way that their names are disparaged uh, in the media, the way that their character is challenged to, to justify their deaths. I think our people that are producing these, these quilts are redeeming these souls, are bringing them back to a space 
where we reminded that this was life that should have been cherished, valued, and appreciated. And because it has been wiped out of this physical world, doesn't mean that their names have to be wiped from our lips. Uh, and that's one of the ways, again, that we ancestrally have kept people alive. That's the immortality that our ancestors have had. We right. speak their names. And so speak, stitching their names is simply speaking their names in this sort of, uh, this visual language of quilting. We do it when we have naming ceremonies, when we uh, have any sort of ceremony in my family, whether it's a birth, a death, a marriage, we speak the name of our ancestors and invite um, invite their memory into that space because they are the, the shoulders that we're standing on. And so these victims, we are stitching their names or they are, they're having their names stitched to speak their names, to know that their deaths are not in vain and their deaths don't end their impact. Uh, in our communities and in our lives. Exactly. Exactly. I, I see them as monuments to their memory. Mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 so necessary. It's so what we do. And like you said, you know, pouring libation and speaking their names and um all of that spiritual work. It's 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 embedded in that. And and as again as a public historian this is important, you know, it's what we must do, you know, to erect some sort of a monument or historical sign or marker. And that's what the purpose, I think the quilt serves that purpose in a different format, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's a tribute, it's, it's a monument to their memory. Well, um, the importance of stitching their name is just like the quilts provided warmth. And the way that those quilts provided warmth were from laying on warm bodies, bodies that were uh, alive, well, thriving, existing in this world. So stitching their names is also a reminder that these people who have lost their lives to uh, racial violence that they once were alive they once were warm they were once able to to cover in one of these quilts to provide one for themselves and their families so yes uh that's important stitch their names and be reminded of their lives yeah i want to encourage folks to do that with your own uh, within your own families my mom is watching and texting me <laughs> and uh, she just reminded me of a project that friends of ours put together for a, a friend of ours who lost her husband and so she has a quilt of his shirts of all of his favorite shirts and as sabrina mentioned right that's bringing a, a tangible practical type of warmth but there's also that that documentation of his life in that for his daughter and for posterity. And so I want to encourage you all to do what my cousin Linda does, what we took on for my friend, and just speak the names of those you love in this format that is distinct or this this art form that's distinct to our community, um, this side, this side of the globe. Yeah. Any other final thoughts, ladies, before we leave? Thank this you. has been oh, great. Oh. I, we need to do this more often. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I agree. I've enjoyed all of this. I really have. Um, but I want to end this way. Um, this is definitely bringing it back full circle because um, in the beginning, everything that you were saying resonated with me, resonated with me with writers. So I mentioned Alice Walker in Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Um, Pearl Clegg with We Speak Their Names. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to end with Margaret Walker because I looked up lineage, which is what I was thinking of earlier. And lineage by Mar Margaret Walker reads, my grandmothers were strong. They followed plows and bent to toil. They moved through fields sowing seed. They touched earth and grain grew. They were full of sturdiness and singing. My grandmothers were strong. My grandmothers were full of memories, smelling of soap and onions and wet clay with veins rolling roughly over quick hands. They have many clean words to say. My grandmothers were strong. Why am I not as they?
Mm-hmm. So yeah. thank you all for sharing with this um, conversation, this discussion that we've had. Um, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for those of you all who joined us um, in the discussion. I really appreciate it. And I've been getting texts too also, <laughs> Dr. Lumumba. So anyway, I just want to thank again uh, the invitation to be a part of this. Lauren Shelby, thank you so much for coordinating this. And thank you, Dr. Tiffany Caesar, for also uh, inviting me to be a part of this. I really appreciate the work that the Walker Center does. Um, this is what art produces. It produces things like this. Yeah. So thank Ashe. you so much. Ashe. Thank you. Wonderful, sisters. Yeah. Thanks for having us.